On December 18, 1944, after two days of heavy fighting, the Germans were nowhere near the River Meuse as initially planned. The 5th Panzer Army, had orders to take Bastogne on the first day of the offensive, and now, because of the poor weather, and wet and muddy ground, which prevented almost any off-road movement, they had been stuck fighting for every road and village, stubbornly defended by a small number of American troops. And while the men of the 28th Infantry Division, bravely defied the far superior German attackers along the Skyline Drive, the 8th U.S. Corps commander, General Troy Middleton, deployed all of his reserves to form the second line of defense, trying to buy time until reinforcements arrived. Determined to hold Bastogne at all costs, he ordered the 158th Combat Engineer Battalion to take the positions north of the town, on a line stretching between the villages of Foy and Neffa. At the same time, he ordered the elements of the Combat Command Reserve from the 9th Armored Division to set two roadblocks on the main road, running from Clairvaux to Bastogne. In the mid-morning of December 18, around 8.30 a.m., while the fight in Clairvaux still raged on, three German tanks, supported by the infantry from the reconnaissance battalion of the 2nd Panzer Division, rolled out of the early morning fog, reaching the northern roadblock set by Task Force Rose. In a short skirmish, American Shermans knocked out one Panzer IV, while crippling the other two tanks, successfully stopping the lead German elements, and forcing them to call in artillery, to lay down a smoke screen between them, and the Americans. When the smoke lifted around 11 a.m., the Germans had already brought two complete panzer companies, with heavier panther tanks. In an uneven fight, task force rose, held as much as possible, and with new German armor arriving, they soon found themselves surrounded. In the afternoon, Captain Rose requested permission to withdraw, but Middleton refused his request. Finally, with the first dark, Task Force Rose, received instructions to pull back to a new position near the village of Vincranger, where they set up another roadblock. During the night, Task Force Rose, was pushed back from their positions after suffering heavy losses. With the road to Bastogne behind them firmly closed, they moved northwest, where they eventually ran into reconnaissance elements of the 116th Panzer Division. Only a few men escaped back to Bastogne. The second roadblock, set by Task Force Harper, came under German attack later in the evening, around 8 p.m. Immediately Tiger and Panther tanks, equipped with new active infrared night sighting devices, blasted into Harper's positions. The German tanks machine-gunned the infantry and destroyed Shermans one by one. After four hours of total hell, around midnight, Harper ordered the remnants of his group to pull back, to combat command headquarters at Longvilly, while he, with his assault gun platoon, remained in a position providing cover for retreating troops. Afterwards, unable to move south, Harper's group escaped northward, up to the town of Hooflies, where they tried to set up defensive positions. It was in Hooflies, on the night from December 18th to 19th, that Colonel Harper, while dismounting from his tank, was caught by machine gun fire and killed. At Longvilly, the combat command headquarters, under Colonel Joseph Gilbreth, anxiously waited for the German attack, accepting their grim fate, and determined to hold their ground. However, the attack never came, as the 2nd Panzer Division turned off west, just a kilometer from Longvilly, following the road north, and racing towards their main objective, the Meurs, leading the capture of Bastogne to Panzer Lea, and 26th Volksgrenadier Division. After breaking free of the terrific traffic jam, at the bottleneck on the river crossing at Drafveld, on December 18, Panzer Lea commander, General Fritz Bayerlein, decided to split his forces into two Kampfgruppe, based around its two Panzergrenadier regiments. Kampfgruppe Hauser, stayed behind to support the 26th Volksgrenadier Division, in dealing with remnants of the American 28th Division, while Kampfgruppe Pershinger, moved along the shortest road leading directly to Bastogne. Bayerlein remained with the lead elements of Kampfgruppe Pershinger, and by the end of the day, he was left with only about 15 Panzer IV tanks, as the half-tracks carrying infantry, were stuck in the muddy roads, far behind. 
Furthermore, a Belgian farmer questioned by his men, reported that at least 40 American tanks and many more vehicles, led by an American two-star general, had passed through the village of Majere that evening. Convinced that the entire American armored division was in front, Bayerlein ordered a defensive deployment on the northeast side of Majere, just five kilometers from Bastogne, and decided to wait for the bulk of his force, to launch the attack on Bastogne the following morning. The Belgian farmer, may have exaggerated, but he didn't lie. The tanks he saw rolling through Majere, were the first tanks from Combat Command B, of the 10th Armored Division, that began to arrive in Bastogne in the afternoon. Upon arrival, Colonel William Roberts, commander of Combat Command B, split his unit into three combat teams. Team O'Hara, under Lieutenant Colonel James O'Hara, moved out southeast to block the road in the village of Warden. Team Desabry, under Major William Desabry, went out onto the Novel Road, north of Bastogne. And finally, Team Cherry, under Lieutenant Colonel Henry T. Cherry, consisting of 17 Shermans and 10 light tanks, moved through Majere, to block the road at Longley. By the time Team Cherry moved to take its positions, Colonel Gilbreth, fearing to end up encircled, had already ordered his men from Combat Command Reserve, to pull back from Longley. The road from Longley to Majere, soon became jammed by the remnants of Combat Command Reserve and stragglers from the 28th Division, moving in one direction, and Team Cherry's vehicles, going the other way. Seeing what was going on, as the withdrawal soon became disorganized, Gilbreth ordered that, not another vehicle, not another man, including the headquarters troops was to leave Longley until daylight. Meanwhile, Bayerline took advantage of this chaos, and at about midnight, men of the Panzalia Division, stormed Majere, overwhelming a small combat engineer's defending force, cutting off the only escape route, of the American troops trapped in Longley. The battle for Longley lasted through the night, and the pressure on the defenders, further increased as the 26th Volks Grenadier Division, joined the fighting. The following morning on December 19, reinforced by Kampfgruppe Hauser, with elements of the 26th Volks Grenadier Division, and the 2nd Panzer Division advancing from the north, the Germans launched a massive attack on the village. As Kampfgruppe Hauser approached the village, they encountered an enormous traffic jam, of American vehicles retreating from Longvalley, hoping to pass through Majere to reach Bastogne. Immediately, the Germans began systematically destroying the trapped American column, with a combination of tank and artillery fire. The road south of Longvalley, received the largest artillery barrage, laid down during the battle. Team Cherry, tried to protect the road, and defend the area but lost all its medium, and light tanks in combat, while destroying only five panzers. In total, more than 100 American vehicles, tanks and howitzers, were destroyed or abandoned during the attack. It was also the end of the 9th Armored Division's Combat Command Reserve. In two days of combat, this unit has lost 175 officers and men, and almost all its armored vehicles and tanks. Some of them, however, managed to reach Bastogne, where they, along with stragglers from the 110th Regiment, were grouped in ad hoc created provisional company-sized units, and deployed all along the defensive perimeter. Despite having no real combat experience, the men of the 9th Armored Division, fought extremely well, on roadblocks that were doomed to failure, successfully slowing down panzers and other leading German units, in what was in reality, a suicide mission. The sacrifice of the Combat Command Reserve, just like the sacrifice of the 110th Infantry Regiment, however, bought time for the much-needed reinforcements to arrive. By 9 a.m. on December 19, all four regiments of the 101st Airborne Division, had already arrived in Bastogne. On the same day, acting on Bradley's order, Middleton pulled his corps headquarters out from Bastogne, leaving General Anthony McAuliffe, a temporary commander of the 101st Division, in command of the town's defense. Also, arriving in Bastogne at about the same time was the 705th Tank Destroyer Battalion, 
sent down from the 9th Army up north, equipped with M18 Hellcats, armed with the new 76mm long-barreled gun, which put it on equal terms with the German Tigers. The three artillery battalions, were well within the comparative safety of the perimeter, positioned in such a way, that they could lay a barrage down, anywhere around it when called upon to do so. The well-coordinated artillery strikes, would prove crucial in stopping the German attacks in the following days. McAuliffe, immediately began deploying his troops, to form an all-around perimeter around Bastogne. He ordered the 327th Glider Infantry Regiment, under Colonel Joseph Harper, to secure the southern sector. The 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Steve Shapwee, moved to the northwest shoulder, to block the roads leading to town from that direction. The 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, under Lieutenant Colonel Julian Yule, was sent on an eastern approach, to reinforce Combat Command Reserve and Task Force Cherry, at Majere and Longvalley. The arrival of the paratroopers, became immediately felt on the battlefields around Bastogne as the 1st Battalion, rushed, to reinforce Task Force Cherry, but went no further than the village of Nefa. However, the paratroopers were able to help Colonel Cherry and his staff, to escape from their headquarters at the Stone Chateau, located a few hundred meters, south of the village. The 2nd Battalion, moved in to block the road in the village of Bizzeri, north of Majere. During the night, the 26th Volks Grenadier Division, launched an attack in this sector, but experienced and aggressive paratroopers stopped them, supported by precise and heavy artillery fire. After being caught in a massive traffic jam on the west side of Bastogne, the 3rd Battalion, moved to a front line around noon, to reinforce Team O'Hara at Warden. Unfortunately for the paratroopers, the Company I, reached Warden just as the tanks of Team O'Hara, pulled back from the village under German pressure. Soon, all hell broke loose, when the paratroopers of the Company I, stumbled on a panzer column supported by infantry. In a wild house-to-house -house battle that erupted, the paratroopers inflicted some casualties on the Germans, but out of about 140 men who had gone to Warden, only 83 men returned to Bastogne the following day. The 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, under Colonel Robert Sink, was sent to take the northeastern sector, with the 1st Battalion, rushed to aid Team Desabry, which had been fighting against elements of the 2nd Panzer Division, from early morning. The 2nd Panzer Division, on its way northwest, towards Meurs, had hit Novel at 4.30 a.m., and after the thick fog lifted, Desabry's tank gunners, started firing with everything they had, inflicting heavy casualties on the Germans. It was like a shooting gallery, and it was not long before ammunition was running short. Outnumbered, and almost without ammo, Desabry asked permission to withdraw, which was declined as the paratroopers were on the way, arriving in the early afternoon. With the arrival of paratroopers, the fighting along the perimeter intensified for the rest of the day. In the afternoon, Desabry's command post, was hit by an artillery shell, killing the 1st Battalion Commander Colonel La Prod, and severely wounding Major Desabry. The Germans resumed the attack at 5.30 a.m., on December 20, when they threw everything they had, on this crucial crossroad, much needed for their advance west. By mid-morning, the grenadiers of the 2nd Panzer Division, cut off Americans at Novil, and pushed towards Foy. Realizing that the defenders of Novel stood no chance, McAuliffe, gave them permission to withdraw, while the other paratroopers moved to reinforce the defense of Foy. Throughout the day, the Germans continued with their fruitless attacks. At Bizzeri, the 26th Volks Grenadier Division, attempted to break through the American defenses, while the Kampfgruppe Pershinger, tried to fight their way further south, near Neffa. But now, they were confronted with well dug in paratroopers, who, helped by strong artillery fire, broke up several attacks. On December 21, realizing that Panzer Lea Division was being wasted in costly attacks against Bastogne defenses, the 47th Panzer Corps commander, General Heinrich von Lutwitz, ordered by a line to bypass the town from the south. During the afternoon, 
Panzerlier Division began advancing west, leaving Kampfgruppe Hauser behind to support the 26th Volksgrenadier Division. With the 2nd Panzer Division moving up north, and Panzerlier on the south, the two divisions met west of Bastogne on December 22, leaving the town fully surrounded. And although the Germans did not firmly control the western sector, they cut off all supply routes leading to the town. Without the armor support, the 26th Volksgrenadier Division's commander, General Heinz Kokert, was fully aware that a difficult task was ahead, as now, the one reinforced German infantry division, stood against one reinforced American airborne division. Nevertheless, he began redeploying his troops preparing for another attack, scheduled for December 23. He sent the 77th Regiment on the northeast side, Kampfgruppe Hauser and the 78th Regiment moved to the southeast, while the 39th Regiment occupied the southern flank. Meanwhile, the Allies made plans of their own. On December 18, Eisenhower met with General Patton in Verdun, to discuss ways to relieve the pressure, on the struggling 1st U.S. Army. During the meeting, Eisenhower asked Patton to move his 3rd Army north, saying, I want you to go to Luxembourg and take charge. When can you start up there? To which Patton replied, Now. You mean today, said Eisenhower. I mean, as soon as you've finished with us here, Patton replied. And he didn't lie. In two days, the Third Corps, turned 90 degrees in winter conditions, and on December 21, spearheaded by the 4th Armored Division, and supported by the 26th and 80th Infantry Divisions, Patton's attack from the south began. On December 22, amid preparation for yet another attack, the Germans decided to offer the Bastogne defenders an honorable surrender. At 11.30 a.m., two Panzerlier officers and their drivers showed up on the road in front of Bastogne under a white flag. The men of the 327th Glider Regiment escorted the German delegation to McAuliffe's headquarters. When told of the surrender demands, McAuliffe, still half asleep, muttered, Nuts! When he tried formally to respond to the surrender ultimatum, McAuliffe had trouble finding the right words, until one of his staff suggested that his first reaction was just fine. So, they typed out nuts on some stationer and handed it over to the German officers. The Germans looked confused with the answer, to which the commander of the 327th Glider Infantry, Colonel Harper, replied, If you don't understand what nuts means in English, it is the same as go to hell, and I'll tell you something else, if you continue to attack, we will kill every goddamn German that tries to break into this city. The word about this famous reply, spread like lightning through the encircled garrison, boosting the defender's morale. And while this brought joy to his troops, McAuliffe had other worries. The 101st Division, was thrown into battle completely unprepared. Many paratroopers were missing their winter uniforms and various other equipment. Furthermore, by the evening of December 22, ammunition reserves were running dangerously low, and now, with supply lines cut off, McAuliffe's primary concern, was that ammunition would run out, before Patton's Third Army arrived. On many occasions, the paratroopers and infantry along the front line, could see the Germans moving in the open, without being able to shoot at them. However, on the night of December 22nd to 23rd, the weather changed. Instead of rain and snow, a high-pressure front, brought extreme cold and cleared the skies. The following morning, the first wave of 16 C-47 transport planes appeared over Bastogne, dropping the first batch of supplies. By dusk, 241 aircraft had flown to Bastogne, dropping 441 tons of supplies. Throughout the day, supplies were distributed rapidly, to where they were needed most. After days of constant battle, most artillery and some infantry units, were virtually out of ammunition, so it was ammunition, that troops were looking for most urgently. Clear skies, also allowed the Allies to unleash their massive air force. Along the entire Ardennes front, 
the Allied fighters and bombers, flew 669 sorties, bombing and strafing German ground troops and supply lines, preventing almost any daytime movement. In addition to a clear sky, a high-pressure front, also brought extreme cold, that froze and hardened the ground, making it more suitable for tanks and off-road movement, reducing the Germans' reliance on roads. After two days of skirmishing, on December 23, the German attack resumed. Kompfgruppe Hauser, supported by infantry from the 39th Regiment, waited patiently until first dark, and then at 6.45 p.m., Panzergrenadiers launched a fierce attack on Marvi, at the southern side of Bastonia. Almost immediately, an engineer platoon and some hundred men from Company G, of the 327th Glider Regiment, were overwhelmed on Hill 500, just south of the village. With almost all the men on Hill 500 killed or captured, the Germans penetrated into Marvi, breaching the defensive perimeter, and threatening the very heart of Bastonia. McAuliffe, in the meantime, scraped together all reinforcements he could find all over Bastonia, and sent them to prevent the Germans from bursting out of Marvi. Backed up by the tanks of T. Mohara, the Americans fought with fierce desperation, managing to hold on to Marvi's northern edge. By morning the German attack stalled, leaving them in control of only the southern fringe of the village. After another failed attack, Kokot realized that his battered division, could not take Bastogne alone. By then, the soldiers on both sides were already exhausted, after days of intense combat, with some units having suffered nearly 75% casualties. At the same time, freezing temperatures were also beginning to take their toll. Morale amongst the German troops was poor, and fuel and ammunition supplies were also running low. While on the other side, Americans were still being resupplied by air. To assess the situation on the front line, on December 24, von Monteufel paid a visit to Kokot's command post, again stressing that Bastogne must be taken at all costs. However, Monteufel also promised, that the experienced and well-equipped 15th Panzergrenadier Division, which had just recently arrived from the Italian front, would be sent to aid Volk's grenadiers. For the rest of the day, Kokot redeployed his troops, for the attack scheduled for Christmas Day. This time, he intended to strike Americans at their weakest point, and with the arrival of leading elements of the 15th Panzergrenadier Division, shortly before midnight on Christmas Eve, by the morning of December 25th, everything was ready for another major German attack. As a prelude to the Christmas attack, instead of a silent night, at around 8.30 p.m. on Christmas Eve, the Luftwaffe bombers, suddenly appeared above Bastogne, dropping hundreds of bombs, reducing the already destroyed city into a pile of rubble. The second raid took place around 3 a.m., and left more parts of the small town, in ruins and disarray. The German attack on Christmas, this time came from the west, when at about 5 a.m., an entire battalion of the 77th Regiment, stormed the village of Champs. In their path stood a single company, Company A of the 502nd Regiment's 1st Battalion. The outnumbered paratroopers, were unable to prevent the Germans from blasting their way into Champs, but their stubborn defense denied them from taking total control of the village. The battle went on for hours, as Company A, fought for each street and house, supported by two tank destroyers from the 705th Tank Destroyer Battalion, that were firing at point-blank range on attacking infantry. The second German thrust, came from the southwest, when the newly arrived regiment from the 15th Panzergrenadier Division, launched the attack near the junction of the 502nd, and the 327th regiments, between Champs and village of Hemru. On the way, the 15th Panzergrenadier Division's tank attack split up, with some tanks heading to the rear of Champs, and others towards Hemru. Now, the only barrier between German tanks and Bastogne, were the men from the 463rd Parachute Field Artillery, stationed in Hemru, armed with the 75mm howitzers. As retreat was not an option, artillerymen grabbed their rifles and machine guns, lowering howitzer barrels enough for the direct fire, 
getting ready to fight for their lives. When the Germans came close, the 463rd's field artillery gunners, unleashed a murderous fire, with a combination of white phosphorus and armor-piercing shells, wrought havoc on the advancing Panzergrenadiers. Meanwhile, to close the gap, Wakorliff sent all the reinforcements he could gather, including almost all tanks and tank destroyers at his disposal, to the west. However, the crucial reinforcements to Americans came from the sky. With the first light of day, P-47s from two fighter groups, began strafing and bombing German troops all around Bastogne perimeter. By early afternoon, the German assault grounded to a halt, after they lost all of their tanks and hundreds of men. Once again, McAuliffe's forces, had managed to block the way into Bastogne, at the last minute. Kokuk tried one more attack, on the morning of December 26, when a small assault group from the 39th Regiment, supported by ten tank destroyers, moved from the south towards Hemru. Although the attack was successful at the beginning, the Germans were soon caught in the open, by the mass American artillery position west of Bastogne, and were literally blown to pieces. It was the last German attempt to break the defense of Bastogne, as their attention was now switched in the opposite direction. From December 21, the Third Army's Third Corps, had broken through the German defense on the southern flank, and advanced rapidly towards encircled paratroopers. By the morning of December 26, the forward elements of the 4th Armored Division, were on the doorstep of Bastogne, and in the late afternoon, the first contact between the two American divisions was made on the outskirts of Bastogne. Although, what the men of the 4th Armored Division had opened, was far from a firm corridor, the relief force had finally arrived, and the paratroopers were no longer under siege. The following day, the corridor was wide and safe enough, for supplies to come in, and most importantly, for the evacuation of the estimated 1,500 wounded soldiers. The opening of the corridor, did not mean the end of the fighting around the city. The battle continued in the following days, and lasted until the beginning of January 1945. However, it was now the Allies who had the initiative, while the Germans went on the defense. During the siege of Bastogne, the 101st Airborne Division suffered 2,370 casualties, and the 10th Armored Division's Combat Command B, another 503. The exact number of dead and wounded, among Combat Command Reserve from the 9th Armored Division, and other miscellaneous and provisional units, is unknown. German losses amounted to some 25,000 killed, wounded and captured, although this is difficult to estimate, since several divisions participated in the battles around Bastogne. High casualties on both sides, proved how hard this battle, for a small town with a peacetime population of 4,000, and a junction of several roads, really was.